So in the past, I've talked about idealism quite a bit. I've given several formal arguments in favor of idealism and several formal disproofs of materialism. A lot of times in the comments or even just in personal conversations I've had, at some point the person who is arguing for the materialist side realizes that I have some pretty solid arguments and they can't exactly answer my objections and they can't really defend their own metaphysical positions when pressed to do so. They really can't find any flaw in my argument because there aren't any. So at that point normally the tactic they turn to is basically so what? <laughs> you know, like, oh, okay, well, if idealism is true, so what? Like, what does that mean? How does that change the way I live my life? And if it doesn't, then I'm somehow justified in continuing to believe in materialism because idealism doesn't matter, pun intended, anyway. Well, that seems like kind of an intellectually lazy position to take to me. To me, that would be basically like saying, well, how does quantum physics affect my life, right? The double slit experiment, so what? Or um, wave particle duality and you know, non-locality and all this other kind of stuff. Well, how does that actually affect the way I live my life? My life is just the same either way, so you know, why should I care about quantum physics or whether the Copenhagen interpretation is right or whatever. People really don't take that view when it comes to scientific theories or things having to do with quantum physics and so on. And so to me it seems really disingenuous to then turn around and say, oh well, when it comes to metaphysics though, oh it's all nonsense because it doesn't affect my life so uh, I just won't bother with it. At the same time, I can kind of understand because why am I investing, you know, so much time or why have I invested so much time and mental, mental energy into defending and, you know, proving the idealistic position and dismantling the materialist position unless it actually makes a difference, like in our lives, in the way we relate to the world or just the way we live our lives. Why does it matter? Why do I care about it so much? And I think that is actually worth talking about. Um, let's, let's say, for the sake of the argument, that it makes no practical difference in my life, in the way I live my life, the way I experience the world, whether I adopt a materialist model or an idealist model. Let's say, in either case, it has no bearing whatsoever on how I actually live my life. Even if that were the case, and I don't think it is, but even if that were the case, um, I actually care about what's true. I think it matters whether the world is fundamentally just made of particles or waves or super strings or whatever you know, basically physical stuff governed by physical laws, all of it existing objectively and externally in a mind-independent material universe. Or whether the universe is mental and all that ultimately exists are minds or one universal mind and mentally generated thoughts and experiences and, you know, mental perceptions that exist within the universal mind and individual minds. I think that just fund fundamentally matters in the same way that, you know, any other truth does. You know, I think it matters whether certain historical events happened the way we were taught they did in history class or whether some alternative historical account uh, is true. In terms of how you live your daily life, 
it probably doesn't ultimately matter whether the earth is round or flat, but very few people are going to say, oh, okay, so we might as well just believe the earth is flat. Even if it doesn't make any practical difference in your daily life, I think it still matters uh, that the earth is round. I still think it's important and valid to want to know the truth about the world you live in and your own true nature. Now, if someone just doesn't care about what's true and they're just not curious about the nature of reality, um, well, okay, just go live your life, uh, go to your job every day, you know, pay your bills, pay your taxes, watch TV, and then die. I mean, if that's the way you feel about it, then that's the way you feel. I, I don't know how to explain to you why you should have a sense of intellectual curiosity. You either have that or you don't. I personally think we all do. I mean, when you're a little kid, you always want to know, um, you know, why is the sky blue? Um, what's the relationship between thunder and lightning? Or where do babies come from? Or whatever. As kids, we're curious about the world. So that's just something that's in us. Like, we just want to know, like, okay, what's the ultimate nature of reality? Is it physical, material? Or is it you know, mental. So it just kind of matters intrinsically in a way. But then going a little bit beyond that, um, I want to try to give a couple of reasons why I do think that it actually makes a practical difference in the way you live your life. I think the way you live your life um, is informed by the narrative that you adopt. What kind of story are you in? And I think if we look at the materialist narrative versus the idealist narrative, I, I think it's not too hard to see that these two um, assumptions lead in two different directions. They result in two different approaches to life. And when I say assumptions, I don't mean that Idealism is just an assumption. In other videos, I've gone into quite a bit of depth as to, you know, the philosophical, rational arguments in favor of idealism and against materialism. So it's not like just an assumption, but I'm saying if you adopt this view or that view, I, I do think it leads to different consequences, and I do think it affects how you live your life, how you understand yourself, the world, and your place in it. So let's say materialism is true. It's very hard for me and for a lot of other people to see how there could be any meaning in life or any purpose in life if materialism is true. I mean, all these atoms bump together and just randomly planets form and revolve around, you know, stars and so, so on, and life evolves, and we're nothing but a collection of cells. You know, our consciousness is just sort of an epiphenomenon that arises through chemical or electrical interactions in the brain or whatever. And your subjective experiences are kind of not real or not important in a sense, because what's really real is matter, <laughs> rocks and, you know, plastic bottles and <laughs> concrete. That's what really exists. Pain is nothing more than, you know, neural activity. Pleasure is nothing more than neural activity. None of it ultimately really means anything. And when you die, nothing happens. <laughs> when you, you die, nothing happens. Just, um, you're not there anymore. The illusion of consciousness is just revealed for the nothingness that it is. And your body rots. And, um... You become part of the carbon cycle or whatever. When your loved ones die, they're just gone, right? And you have an emotional response to that, but that emotional response isn't really very important either because it's just chemical and electrical activity and nothing more. It doesn't mean anything. What's the meaning of your life? Well, basically to survive and reproduce. Why? So that you can have offspring who 
also will survive and reproduce so that the meaningless process of evolution can continue. And eventually, all life will be gone. You know, every star eventually dies. You know, the planet will burn up or freeze or, you know, whatever, become lifeless. Some meteor will hit it and then no one will be alive to remember anything. None of it will matter. The universe doesn't exist for anything. You don't exist for anything. It's all meaningless. It's all absurd. The only meaning that exists is whatever subjective meaning you attribute to it. So if you think it's meaningful to collect stamps or something, then that's the meaning of life for you. But life doesn't actually have any intrinsic meaning. Your life doesn't have any intrinsic value. That's one hell of a narrative, isn't it? I mean, what do you do with that? So I could flip the question around and I could say, okay, well, if materialism is true, so what? So should I reject materialism simply on the basis that a materialist can't answer the so what question? Because that's what they're basically suggesting the other way around. I'm arguing against materialism. I'm arguing in favor of idealism. And they're saying, oh, well, even if what you're saying is true, so what? You know, why does it matter? Um, like, how does that actually affect the way I live my life? So I'll just ignore it. And I'll go on believing materialism as if it's the default position. And it's a curious thing to me that people act as if materialism is the default position. Why, why should it be? And of course, I've made the argument before that basically idealism should be the default position. Because we know that we're conscious. We know that consciousness exists. We know that we're having mental experiences. We're experiencing mental perceptions in our minds. That's what we know for sure. What we can't prove is that these mental perceptions in our minds actually correspond to an external, objective, physical, mind-independent reality. And I've also explained that's not solipsism. Idealism is not solipsism. Um, I, I'm not going to explain that again here. Some people have a hard time understanding that, though. But to me, that's the default position. Unless you can somehow prove or provide evidence that there is a mind-independent material universe, then the default position is to just accept what you know and be skeptical about things that are not proven. I know that consciousness exists. I know that I'm a mental being having mental experiences. And the things that I don't know is that those mental experiences are caused by some mind-independent world, something that exists outside of the mind or outside of any mind. So idealism is the default position. Materialism requires us to adopt additional unproven assumptions. Occam's razor just demands that we don't. <laughs> But let me get to the question of why does idealism matter? If idealism is true, so what? Because I've already kind of touched on the idea that if materialism is true, that actually doesn't really make any difference in your life. Okay, you're just a collection of cells and molecules and, you know, atoms and stuff bumping into each other. Nothing you do matters. Well... If idealism is true, then I think the possibility of meaning emerges. If the universe is mentally generated, then it seems to me that it's much more likely that it has some kind of purpose which can be fulfilled. And if idealism is true, that opens the door to things like the immortality of the soul or, you know, life after death reincarnation, right? There isn't one well-defined theory of what is idealism and everything it implies. It's just a basic position on whether the universe is fundamentally mental or physical. Idealism says it's fundamentally mental. And 
Just like if you assume that the universe is basically material, you eventually sort of come to the conclusion that mind and mental phenomena is a kind of illusion. On the reverse side of that, once you accept that the universe is fundamentally mental, I think inevitably you eventually come to the conclusion that what we call the material universe is actually the illusion. It's a kind of illusion. Now, it, yeah, it's real in a sense, but in another sense it's, it's not. It, at least it's not what we perceive it to be. So I think idealism matters in terms of the search for meaning and purpose, which is very fundamental to our lives. How could any belief or any theory have any practical relevance to your life whatsoever if your life is ultimately meaningless? It's nonsensical to even ask the question of whether an idea or a belief matters or not if you're operating within a worldview where nothing ultimately matters. <laughs> right? So if nothing ultimately matters, then of course philosophy doesn't matter, science doesn't matter, you know, nothing else matters. Only if you're operating within a worldview where meaning and purpose are possible is it even meaningful to ask the question, so what? Or why does this matter? So when the materialist asks, why does idealism matter, or let's say you're right, so what? He's basically asking a question related to meaning. He's asking me to defend the meaning of my view. And basically he's saying that unless my view is meaningful, he's going to reject it. So why, why wouldn't that also be an argument in favor of rejecting the view that he currently holds, materialism? Because it can't offer any meaning. Therefore, belief in materialism is absolutely meaningless. So it's almost like he's adopting an idealistic framework in order to be able to ask questions related to meaning and purpose in order to try to argue against it. He's sawing off the branch that he's sitting on, sort of. But I think another practical reason why idealism matters has to do with morality. So you have meaning and purpose, but you also have morality. And in some ways, morality is the most practical branch of philosophy. There's nothing more practical, there's nothing more relevant to your daily life than questions related to how you should live. And that's what moral philosophy is. It's asking, what is the good? What should I do? How should I live my life? I don't think materialism has a good answer to that question. I don't think questions of morality can be separated from questions of meaning. I think if ultimately we did live in a meaningless universe, like materialists believe, then I think it's very hard to address moral questions because none of it matters. I mean, if you murder and rape, so what, ultimately? Everything is just survival of the fittest, might equals right, but even then, that's meaningless because survival of the fittest, okay, you survived, you're still going to die, so it's kind of meaningless that you survived. Aside from the fact that you lived long enough to pass on your genes, and maybe you're offspring live long enough to pass on their genes, but that's about as meaningful as a chain letter. <laughs> and might equals right. Okay, you have all the power, so you make the rules, you do whatever you want, and then you die. Okay, so that was all ultimately pretty meaningless, wasn't it? You collected all this gold, you couldn't take any of it with you once you died. What was the point of any of it? So might equals right and survival of the fittest and all that is really not an answer. Unless you accept that there is a spiritual dimension to existence. Unless you acknowledge that you have a spiritual nature and an eternal soul. And some purpose that your eternal soul is striving for. Such as ultimate 
self-knowledge or enlightenment or apotheosis. There's no other possibility of meaning without a spiritual aspect to existence. And idealism basically says that the spiritual aspect of existence is existence, right? It's not that there's a material aspect and a mental aspect. The mental aspect is all there is. All that exists is the universal mind, individual sort of fragmented minds that are basically contained within that mind, and mental experiences, thoughts, ideas, and subjective mental states that exist within that universal mind or these individual minds. And I don't want to get too esoteric because there's a lot of different views you could take that would still fall within the you know, general category of idealism. So, I mean, you might think that there's just a universal mind and that's all there is and all these separate selves are a kind of illusion and that the goal of existence is to reunite everything with the one universal mind. You know, you could take a view that's some version of that. Or you might think that fundamentally reality is separate minds and sort of through their interaction somehow reality becomes. Because people talk about the first cause argument, and they're like, oh, well, everything that exists has to have a cause. The universe had to have a cause. You know the first cause argument. But, of course, the problem with that argument that a lot of atheists have pointed out is the argument states a rule, and then within the same argument, it introduces an exception to the rule, right? Everything has to have a cause, except this one thing, this one causeless cause. Well, logically, if you can have one uncaused cause, one unmoved mover, if the laws of reality or being or existence permit that, then why would it be limited to one? Why couldn't you have two or three or an infinite number of uncaused causes? All right, so if it's possible for there to be one uncaused cause, why wouldn't it be possible to have a plethora of uncaused causes. So it is possible to take a, a view of idealism that starts from the premise that fundamentally, instead of there being one universal mind, there are perhaps an infinite number of monads. And together, somehow, they mentally generate the material universe or the phenomenal universe of experience in which they all participate. I don't want to get into that um, rabbit hole right now. But I think in either case, as long as you're under the idealist umbrella, questions of meaning and morality remain relevant. If you dismiss that in favor of a materialistic, physicalist model, I think any possibility of meaning or morality dissolve. Now, in the version of idealism that um, I personally hold, absolute morality, or the absolute standard of right and wrong, whatever you want to call it, is ontologically grounded in the nature of being itself. The nature of being is mental in idealism. If the ground of being was just atoms or, I don't know, quantum fluctuations in a vacuum or whatever, it's hard to see how reality could have a nature which would have anything to do with morality. But if being itself has a nature, has a will, then whatever happens, whatever we do, is either in alignment with the divine will or in conflict with the divine will. If you take the idealistic view that ultimately everything is kind of one, we are all aspects or expressions of the one universal mind, then anything we do as individual selves that is in conflict with our true self, 
the universal mind or is in conflict with our true nature, which is the true divine nature, or anything we do that runs counter to the divine will, which is our true will, puts us in conflict with ourselves, and it creates suffering. It's good to be in harmony with yourself. It's bad to be conflicted and fractured and torn apart. I'm simplifying it a little bit there, but I think you get my point. So now questions of morality basically have to do with whether our actions, or even thoughts and words, are in alignment with our true nature, are in alignment with our true will, in other words, divine nature, and the divine will, the nature and will of God, if you will, or our actions are out of alignment and they cause us to experience separateness, which is painful. Think of your hand being cut off, that's painful. <laughs> Think of a fish out of water, that's painful. When we're separated from our true self, that is painful. That is the source of all suffering. In other words, that is the source of all evil. So evil or wickedness or sin or immorality or whatever you want to call it is nothing more than acting out of alignment with the divine will, it is acting out of alignment with our own true nature or divine nature, the divine will. Morality, or you know, righteousness, doing the right thing, doing good, simply means acting out of our true nature, acting in accordance with our true will. Do you see it? So people have asked me, because I am a moral realist, I do believe in absolute right and wrong, and that's kind of my model of moral realism in a nutshell right there. But then, you know, people have asked me about situational ethics and so on. Well, I see no conflict between situational ethics and absolute morality, as I've explained it. Because as I've explained, absolute morality basically has to do with the question, am I in alignment with my true nature? Am I acting in alignment with my true will? In other words, the divine will? which is grounded in the divine nature? Or am I acting out of alignment? And in situational ethics, you know, the question is, okay, well, in this situation, what's the right thing to do? Would that also be the right thing to do in a different situation? Well, no, a lot of times it wouldn't. But when you understand absolute morality in the way that I am explaining it, you can see there's no philosophical conflict there. Because in this specific situation, there are things that I could do that would be in alignment with my true nature and my true will, and other things that would be in conflict with my true nature and my true will. And in a different situation, I might behave differently, but I would still be behaving in that different situation, in a way that is in alignment with my true nature and my true will. And in the past, um, people have used the analogy or the comparison of math, right? And they're like, oh, well, the laws of morality are subjective, whereas the rules of math or something like that are objective. Well, not really. Um, I mean, they are. The, the rules of mathematics are absolute, I mean, at least in a sense, but the laws of math are also situational. I mean, for example, is 2 plus 2 4? Well, it depends on your base system, doesn't it? I, I mean, if you don't understand that, I don't want to go over anyone's head, but depending on uh, the base system you're using, um, you know, maybe 2 plus 2 is something else. You know, 2 plus 2 could be a lot of things, depending on what base system of math you're using. You know, we just happen to be using a base 10 system. 
But you could use a binary system or a base six system or lots of other systems, and two plus two would not equal four. It would equal something else, right? So that's situational mathematics, if you will. That doesn't imply that, you know, ultimately mathematics is just subjective. No, the laws of mathematics are uh, objective, and the rules of morality are objective. Um, God's nature really is what it is. It's unchanging. It couldn't be otherwise. Now, maybe you don't believe in God. Just understand what I'm saying. I mean, maybe for you, you even think something like the laws of mathematics basically are God. You know, that's fine. If you want to think in those terms, if that works for you, that's fine with me. But certain things flow from God's nature, like God's will. But anyway, I know maybe this has been a little bit rambling, but that's my short answer. Why does idealism matter? You know, if idealism is true, so what? Well, basically it matters because otherwise nothing matters. It matters that idealism is true because only once we've accepted the truth of idealism do questions about meaning and morality become possible. So I'll just end with that for now. But in closing, I'll just add that in the past, I've mostly scripted videos, and there's a few reasons for that. One is I feel like if you're publishing something and it's going to be out there on the internet forever, or at least until they remove it because it, they don't like your ideas or whatever, I think it's worth putting some thought into how you're going to say something, especially if you're trying to construct a philosophical argument. I think it's good to write it down, go over it a few times, see if there's any gaps in your reasoning. Oh, I need to fill in this here. Or, oh, I think there's, you know, maybe a possible objection at this point that I need to deal with. And, you know, you can kind of be a little bit more structured with it when you write it down rather than when you're just going off the fly. At this point, I've pretty much done that. So, I mean, if you want to go and see a much tighter argument for idealism or anything else, you can go back to some of my older videos where I've been, you know, very tedious and meticulous with it. But now that I've kind of laid that foundation, I kind of like the freedom of just being able to talk about stuff, maybe based on new things that pop into my head or questions and objections I see in the comment sections and things like that. Um, number two, it is a lot of work to produce videos that way. I mean, a lot of people that just watch a video, they might not appreciate that because they watch it and it's a 20 minute video or a 30 minute video, maybe an hour long video. So they think that it took me an hour or less to make that. No, I mean, Number one, I'm not even going to count all the years that I've spent reading lots of different things and thinking about lots of different things, arguing with lots of people and debating to kind of test different arguments and ideas. I mean, I'm just counting on the time that actually goes into making the video. I mean, it might take several hours just to script out a 30-minute video. And then I've got to record it. And as I'm reading it into the microphone, I'm going to make some mistakes. I'm going to have to go back and edit it, right? All of that takes time. I mean, one video is probably at least one full day's worth of work, you know, seriously. And that's my videos where I don't even have, you know, complex graphics. And yeah, I mean, it's pretty much just an audio video. And even that is basically a full day's work. And I'm really not getting paid for it. Every now and then someone makes a donation to my channel or something um, and, you know, that helps. But honestly, that's pretty rare. I don't get a lot of donations. Um, my channel is not and never has been monetized, so I'm not getting ad dollars. Um, th this is all just unpaid work for me. So I'm doing it because I, I want to do it. I have ideas that I want to put out there. And I hope that it will make a difference in other people's development or, you know, in their lives or in their way of thinking or in their search for 
meaning or their search for understanding themselves and reality and so on. But just the reality of life is that there's a limit to how much time you can spend um, doing unpaid labor because, you know, you have to make money too because we kind of like eating and things like that. Um, but then also, over the last couple of years or so, several people have kind of commented that, you know, they enjoy my videos, but it's all scripted and they'd kind of like to see me just be me and just kind of be a little more freestyle. And, you know, some people enjoy that. So those are some of the reasons why I'm kind of going to more of an unscripted style. I probably will still continue doing scripted videos from time to time. If I have a lot of information to present and I want to do it in a really organized way. But because of the amount of time and work that takes, uh, I can only do, you know, one or two of those every so often. And then, you know, viewers and subscribers get kind of bored because I'm not publishing regularly and stuff. So that's basically where I'm at. Also, I guess I've kind of come to a point where it's therapeutic for me a little bit to just get on the mic and rant a little bit. You know, I have stuff on my chest. I just want to get it off. And this is a way for me to do it. So I actually kind of enjoy just turning the mic on and just letting it rip a little bit. So along with that, it's also pretty likely that I'm going to start talking about some less deep philosophical heavy topics. And I might just talk about some totally random shit too. Um, now those of you that tuned into my channel just because of the really high level, really deep uh, intellectual content, maybe you won't like it as much if I'm ranting about, you know, stuff to do with, you know, like whatever, just like random daily stuff that we all think about. But that's, that's kind of something I want to start doing more, just like turning on the mic and sharing random thoughts about random stuff. You know, some of it kind of irrelevant. Like I'm thinking about talking about sex dolls. Uh, in fact, I may do that one next. Just because it's something I've seen come up a lot. Um, a lot of MGTOW guys and other stuff, you know, they're talking about sex dolls. I've seen a debate o about uh, sex robots and stuff. And it's like, well, it's, it's really not the most um, profound or important thing. But it's still interesting to talk about stuff like that. So whatever. Uh, but thanks for listening. I uh, hope you've enjoyed this freestyle rant. And uh, I'll see you next time. Peace.